Fernand, it is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you to this very special occasion, the inaugural address of Professor Henry Bazaidenhout. In particular, I would like to express a warm welcome to Professor Robert Balfour, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Teaching and Learning, Professor Avi Kotsa, Executive Dean, Faculty of Health Sciences, Dr. Sibu Siso Chalafu, Executive Director, Student Life, Prof. Mala Singh, Executive Director, People and Culture, and Prof. Andre Heymans, Deputy Director, School of Economic Sciences. Welcome also to colleagues from all three campuses, friends, and family especially two special family members, Prof. Henry's mother, Mrs. Dr. Blanche, and his aunt, Mrs. Jeanette Malan. This is indeed a proud and joyful occasion for the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences, the Northwest University, and all of us present. Inaugural lectures are an essential component of the university's public events program, helping to create a wider awareness of the latest developments in research in the faculty and university. It also provides a platform for a university to showcase its academics, introduce them to the academic and non-academic community of the university, and to provide for engagement with the general public. The inauguration of professors is a special occasion during which newly appointed full professors are inducted into office. It is a significant milestone in any academic's career. It is an opportunity for them to inform colleagues in the university and the general public about their research journey and update colleagues on their current and future research directions. It also grants the new professor the opportunity to answer for himself regarding his position in and contributions to his chosen subject field. The Faculty of Economic Sciences is 
privilege to have six staff members presenting inaugural addresses this year in various disciplines. Prof. Henry, tonight you can celebrate a significant milestone with family, friends, and both previous and current colleagues. This inaugural address is an opportunity for the university to recognize and showcase your academic achievements. Tonight, you will share your research interests with colleagues both within the faculty and more broadly. Ladies and gentlemen, I've always had interesting conversations with Prof. Henry. I recall the first time he walked into my office and shared with me his ideas about unconscious bias, an interesting topic that caught me completely off guard. He left me with a few interesting, deep and thought-provoking questions. Today, I'm sure we are all looking forward to something equally interesting in his inaugural lecture, Dichotomy and Dualities, at the crossroads of artificial stupidity, the future of academia in South Africa. At this point, I would like to request Prof. Andre Heymans, Deputy Director, School of Economic Sciences, to introduce Prof. Henry Bezaidenhout. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> um, tonight, I've been asked to introduce to you Prof. Henry, the side note, um, and it's an honor and a privilege for me to do so. Henry, the side note, is the third child and only son of Renier and Dorothy, the side note. He was born on the 21st of July, 1972 in Freiburg in the then Northern Cape. Henry matriculated in 1990 at Wurzkel Waterkloof in Pretoria. From 1991 to 1996, he obtained a BCom degree in economics, an honors in uh, econometrics, and an MCom in econometrics at the University of Pretoria. During this time, he was also a junior lecturer and lecturer in statistics at the University of Pretoria and Vista University. After working in the United Kingdom as a development economics consultant for several years, he completed his PhD in economics at the university, um, well, at Northwest University in 2007 under the uh, supervision of Prof. Vim Nudia. Henry was permanently appointed at the NWU in 2008 as a senior lecturer, and as part of his continuing professional development, uh, he completed a BA Honours in International Relations at UNISA. That was, however, only the start of Henry's long list of additional qualifications, and I'm sure most of you, you will know that Henry um, can't leave education alone. So. Um, uh, he then um, went on to get a certificate, advanced certificate and diploma in international trade from the International Trade Institute of South Africa. Um, his special interest being uh, expertise, or his special interest being uh, on international trade and foreign direct investment in Africa. However, since 2015, Henry specialized also in cross-cultural intelligence and obtained all six major international cross-cultural certifications worldwide which is quite a feat in itself. He also became a certified executive coach and was subsequently involved in leadership development in senior management at the university, um, at Northwest University. Um, as part of Henry's academic career uh, at the NWU, he's published 22 accredited papers, national and international, in peer-reviewed academic journals, and has presented 25 papers, as you would see on the slides there as well, um, at national and international conferences, traveling widely. Three of his publications were included in books by the World Bank and UNU Wider. Henry is actively involved as a supervisor to postgraduate students. 12 PhD and master students have completed their studies under his supervision. And he also, also serves as external examiner for masters and PhD studies at various universities and regularly reviews papers for accredited national and international academic journals and conferences. Henry has lectured in the Netherlands, Finland, the United States, Namibia, and Thailand, 
and he's currently a visiting professor at the International College of the National Institute of, um, of Development Administration in Bangkok, Thailand. From 2015 to 2020, he served as a regional representative of South Africa, uh, Southern Africa for the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment at Columbia University's Earth Institute in New York. From 2014 to 2017, he also served on economic diplomacy of the South African Institute for International Affairs. <clears throat> in 2021, Henry got restless once again and embarked on an additional qualification in leadership, completing the Stanford Graduate School of Business Lead Certificate, placing him in a unique position as someone with keen insights into leadership, uh, leadership development, which is beneficial for the university and used by him to prepare his students for the workplace. On a personal level, Henry has several passionate interests, um, and I'm, I'm sure everyone here would um, pass that exam if you were asked. He's obsessed with travel and gaining cultural experiences. Nothing gives him more pleasure than arriving in a new country uh, for a new cultural experience. He also has an insatiable appetite for knowledge, and he's constantly challenging himself to understand more today than he did yesterday. And um, I'm sure that all of you would agree that um, Henry never shies away from a difficult subject. And tonight, I bet you he's going to not disappoint. I then ask um, Henry to please come forward to um, uh, give us his address. Good evening. <clears throat> Trust the audio is fine. I remarked when I came in that I didn't remember that we do the red toga tonight, otherwise I would have worn a yellow underwear across my pants <laughs> and stand here. Do the Superman thing. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, I think Prof. Babs really um, mentioned almost everyone. I hope you're all feeling welcome and feeling appreciated at the end when we look at the acknowledgements and saying thank you. I'll try to cover as many of you as possible. Um, I know the person pretty much discussed this, so I'm not really even going to go on to that. <coughs> um, I titled the slide, Never One Thing. So yes, um, I probably have ADHD, whatever, when it comes to gaining knowledge. Uh, but my real passion, um, and it really comes out when I deal with my students, is about education and empowering people. Um, a while ago, somebody asked me, well, why am I here? What's my life mission? And I said, well, I build people, and then I build bridges between people. Um, <clears throat> So that means that really seeing st students change, their lives changed, uh, there's a different mark in change in students in the last couple of years. Um, and that's quite actually one of the keystones that we need to talk about. Um, more than that, being a visiting professor at Ikon Nida in Thailand, I've now taught students from more than 20 countries. That really keeps you on your toes, but also exposes you to the commonalities across cultures, and also the differences. Um, the, the leadership development, I really just also quickly want to point out that Andre mentioned is really for the senior mem members of management here. Thank you for the opportunities and entrusting me in your world. Uh, tonight's topic, 
Dichotomy Dualities at the Crossroads of Artificial Stupidity, the Future of Academia in South Africa. It should also have a subtext, the quest for visionary leadership. It is something that academia is not known for and an opportunity for whoever wants to catch that fruit. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go into definitions. I think we uh, don't have enough time, hopefully, but also you've got, you've got your phones and you've got Google, I presume. If you really struggle, raise your hand. Right, so why, why this topic? Why did this really touch me? Um, beginning of June, I went to Germany, uh, sort of more on a holiday, uh, getting my mind straight after COVID. And uh, up till then, I was quite content to come and deliver a paper on FDI in Africa tonight. But I was there and I experienced the culture, I experienced the people. It really came to me that globally we are in experiencing uh, I don't want to call, be negative and calling it a negative thing, but there's a conundrum. Um, you'll see many people call it the intellectual civil war. Um, taking place, and it's coming from all sides. It's not just a question of it's the students, or it is university management, or it is the professors. Um, it is as if... Many, many people say, have we all gone and lost our minds? And that then, listening to Thomas Sowell, actually economist, prof, economics professor of Stanford, um, he really spoke about the concept of artificial stupidity. We're talking about artificial intelligence, industry 4.0, but what's happening to us as humans? What are we teaching our students? Uh, what's happening in our discussions with one another? Uh, what happens when you put on the television and you think like, I can watch anything but absolutely no news channel? Is that not what we call artificial stupidity? Because who of us were born stupid? Who wants to harm another person deliberately? And yet, if you look at the discourse, cancel culture and all of this, people are really losing their minds. And that also is part of why we're at a crossroads. Fortunately, I think so far at Northwest University, we've been spared a lot of what's coming. But it's coming. There was this afternoon reports on a professor at, uh, emeritus professor at, Kofsis, who was sort of forced to leave the academy. Um, UCT has really stuck their foot into it. There's actually now professors of, well, ex-professors of UCT writing books against UCT. Um, so they're on the cutting edge of this. While I think our discourse is still a bit diff different, and that's my mission tonight. I'm not here to persuade you anything. I'm not here to have an ideological point of view. I'm here to make you aware of what's going on. <clears throat> what you do with it, that's up to you. I prefer the Immanuel Kant interpretation when people fall into these situations, and that is, do not have an opinion, have an armed intellectual third opinion. Do not get caught up in dualities, and we'll get to the dualities as well. Our problem is academia, as many of us, the sort of in self-reinforcing bubbles of isolation of research. You only do research with the people that do the research that you do. You only talk to the people that do the research that you do. So we only squawk and quack like the people that we do. And in time, if we are not careful and not, do not expose ourselves to different points of view, we sort of become balkanized and alienated from the rest of academia. Right, building up to COVID, why we're at a crossroads, there's certain things that happens and I need to quickly highlight. Um, the first is sort of called the academic administrative cost and bureaucracy, but it's a much bigger topic. We can talk about just that tonight, but I'll try to keep that less than two minutes. 
Um, we had the industry 4.0 gig economies. We had companies like Google and Facebook starting their own universities. That should have been the wake-up call in the first place. If the most liberal, most dynamic places of employment in the world are saying, sorry Harvard, sorry Stanford, sorry Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, you're just not making the cut, um, what's going on? Uh, then there's the democratization of education. Now that might ask a lot of questions, but actually it's quite an interesting topic. Uh, it's got nothing to do with Jacob Zuma. Um, he was just a person bringing it to South Africa, and uh, unfortunately that is changing the environment, and lots of people are not ready for that. Then we have a new client. The new generation called Generation Z or iGen or whatever is markedly different than any other generation before us. And I'll allude to that when I get to that point. <clears throat> it's one of the key things that's driving this change. Now a lot of people will say, yeah, but the baby boomers hated Generation X and Generation X hated the millennials. The statistics are coming in and it's shocking to see the differences that we have in this new generation, but we'll get there. Also a new customer. New customer actually mean employers. People who need to employ our product, our students. The expectations of the job market has changed. In South Africa a lot, but globally, um, you knew about the gig economies and uh, companies like Uber, that didn't have any drivers because they all worked for themselves, or Airbnb that didn't have any uh, hotel hospi uh, hospitalers because they all work for themselves. Well, we're now looking at a gig 2.0. You will not be working for the company, but you will be formally employed. It's a new phenomenon that's uh, especially coming out of Silicon Valley and London specifically is has taken it up because companies like Uber lost their court cases. And lastly, <coughs> is South Africa unique? Absolutely. We face challenges uh, that is not, you know, when you read a lot of the American material, a lot of the UK material, don't you want to go to the Canadian and Australian material, um, you know, South Africa is on a different, different planet. And that's, I think, why it's so important to wake up and see that we don't import the worst. Let's rather import the best and take care of our students. Because in the end, remember, let me put it bluntly, if somebody goes through your hands and they are worse off for it, you have taken 60 to 80 years of a person's life. If they are better for it, you have given them 60 to 80 years. And that's just current statistics. It might even be more. I heard the other day that the first person that will get to 150 has already been born. We don't know who it is. So bureaucracy and democratization, I put them together because it's actually a joint process that took place as a historical function of university meant that only 2% of the population globally went to universities. Um, but from the 1950s, after the, the Second World War, with all the newfound wealth, it was deliberately decided by the US government, the UK government, and even the Russian government to democratize academia and open it up and get to at least 20%. So when you watch Indiana Jones and you see the professor teaching a class and then jumping through the window to go off on his adventure, that was in the time when there was 2% students. Each professor had a daily interaction with every student. <clears throat> the problem, if you open it up, you suddenly find a growing in bureaucracy. Estimated in the 1960s, administrative costs at universities was 30% of the total budget. In the 2010s, that administrative cost has gone to 70%. So who feeds the beast? You do. 
my fellow academics, you're the ones bringing the money. So unfortunately, there's this already a dichotomy between administration and academia. And it should not be. Um, once again, going back to that's why we need visionary leadership. Now we need to talk about Generation Z. Who, who of you here is a lecturer or a professor or deals with students of any sort? Can you raise your hands? How would you describe them in one word? Entitled? Arrogant? It's not going well so far. Where's the loving kind? <laughs> right. Now, one might also say this is not exactly true for South Africa, but we have shrinking households. Most of the Western world has shrunk to a one-child household. Even in South Africa, we see the new middle class, mostly two children households, not more. Also, parents are waiting longer to have children. So they come around later in life when people have more resources and are much more empowered and wise of life themselves. So they also tend to overprotect their new investment. And that's a very big problem for all of us. Um, Bill Maher had a video called uh, Hey Buddy you can YouTube it it's about this generation a lot of it also is very true but scraying and at the one point he picked up that when we were children and your pacifier felt out your parents would just pick it off the carpet and put it back in your mouth dog hair, cat hair, cat hair, whatever no, who cares Today's children are raised with cell phones as pacifiers. So there's that little small screen from the word go. So they are connected, but they've got no connection. So how do you expect them to relate to you and any opinion that you have? Because this entire world revolves around that connection and what people in that connection tell him you should think. Also, <clears throat> in all generations, this is the, the, the youth that has spent the most time with their parents because they've got no friends. They're not allowed to go to the mall alone or walk to the cafe to buy whatever. They have to be driven. And it's all scheduled. Who of you, produced, who of you had parents who scheduled your entire week from 5 o'clock every morning till 11 at night. It's a tendency right now for parents to do that with their children. So, guess what? When Bill Maher said, your best friend's mum and dad, it's actually true. But that also implies that mum and dad has to come and punish you when you hurt them. So come to academia if I say something that offends one of them, they will directly contact Prof. Balfour. They will not even contact Babs. Because they will go to the highest possible authority and he must punish you. Otherwise, he must be punished. Because that's what they were taught. So you all know about safe spaces <coughs> and, of course, finding meaning in activism and socialization because that's what they've been getting from the media. I saw yesterday that for the first time in the U.S. Census, up to the age of 34, most people indicated place of residence, home of parents. And there you thought it was only the Portuguese and the Spanish that stayed with the family till they got married. Now in the United States, the average young person is staying at home till he's 34. So we have a real change in dynamic in what we're dealing with as our client on a daily basis. Does this explain something to you? Do you maybe see something that you haven't seen before? 
When we look at employers, <coughs> our friend Klaus Schwab, it's very difficult not to do the James Bond villain impersonation we talk about Klaus Schwab, but in the employment of the future, they list these skills as what is really needed. Employers will increasingly want cognitive flexibility, so there's no sense in teaching you one thing and you become a master of it. You need to be flexible. Digital literacy and computational thinking. Quite interesting. <clears throat> Judgment and decision making, call it critical thinking. Emotional and social intelligence. Because if we assume that in the industry 4.0 environment, most jobs will be automated, who are you going to work with? Other people. For the first time in our history, business will become and will have to become people-centric. Lastly, a creative and innovative mindset. Also something that, as educators, we must really pay attention to. Because it's very easy not to include that in our classes. But talking about the South African situation briefly, I'm not here to discuss politics or uh, what I think about which president, but Prof. Tien Silov, one of our previous vice chancellors, said in an interview, sort of, if you look at South, South African universities, there's sort of four issues, um, party political, ideological, philosophical currents, which we're going to really talk about tonight more, and the financial implications of the democratization process. Um, government, as you all know, is struggling to keep the lights on. So where do you think the subsidies for publications will go? If uh, our current minister in Zimanda has to choose between paying student bursaries for NISFAS or subsidizing your paper, what's he going to do? That's the unfortunate reality, and we need to take that into account. None of us can do anything about it, but government is scaling down subsidies and might even be cutting some in the near future. We sort of talked about artificial stupidity. <coughs> um, in general, really, I, my conclusion is that artificial stupidity is a valid concept for the simple reason that so few people are willing to st stand up and stand in the gap. And as I have discovered, discussed a new client or new students with you, um, it's not about criticizing them. Not to say you're mad. Nobody's ever solved any situation by calling people names and by isolating them. <coughs> they don't understand it, but as an adult, you should. One of our first contacts that's happening is an absolute attack on free speech, especially in the West. I use the West loosely, mostly Western Europe, Northern Europe, and North America, north of the Rio Grande. For those of you, got some. But it's somehow also prevalent in countries like Korea and Japan. You will not find these debates in India. You will not find them in China. You will not find them in Russia. Eastern Europe has already decided where they stand. Um, and in South Africa, we have now have the Free Speech Union, established to saying, be very careful, because their role is literally to protect people in the workplace who are told to shut up and toe the party line rather than speak the truth. Um, so the end, South Africa still has a constitution, and the constitutional court does uphold the fact that you do not have the right not to be offended by me. I have no right to commit hate speech, and we should separate that. That is a real issue in South Africa. I'm not trying to whitewash that. But our constitutional court is still very, very clear on that. Um, you won't find the South African police coming to your home saying that somebody uh, reported your Twitter comment and that you are now being investigated for a non-crime hate incident. 
But it's coming, it's as I said, UCT, UP and University of Free State already have cancellation incidents of senior academics. Um, one of the great examples is actually the Vice Chancellor of UCT. And forget me, I will not get that name 100% right, Mamuketi Fakeng, um, who hold, thought it wise to have a conference about what does science say about LGBTQ+. Now, in my mind, personally, I would say there can be nothing more academic than saying what does the science say, but for people from the trans community, um, took her on and she publicly apologized. Roll back the whole conference. It comes to the same thing, political correct, correctness is controlling or for thought tyranny. Be careful what you say, we all know it. We all say stuff to keep people happy. But when somebody insists that you should be politically correct, you should call them out. It's a form of thought tyranny. Who gives you the right to tell me what I think? How do you know what I think? Let's start with that. You can assume what you think I think, but I promise you, you don't know. So, when we call each other on political correctness, don't force people to compel, well, don't compel people to speak in certain ways. Rather teach people to act appropriately and to be cognizant of differences and appreciate each other. Next concept is war, word, and idea laundering. I was quite amused when I saw this, but then uh, they opened up with a George Orwell quote. Um, I never thought that I'd live in an area where George Orwell would be the accidental prophet of the time. There is no swifter route to corruption of thought than through the corruption of language. And what we find is feel-good concepts. Is there anyone in this room who does not want to be anti-racist? Is there anybody in this room that does not believe that black lives matter? Is there anybody here that does not believe that we should have the most diverse and inclusive working environment possible? It sounds... No, no, no honest person who has any form of emotional intelligence will criticize the thought, but go in and research what those concepts mean by the people who are propagating it, and you'll be scared. I'm not going to go into all of that. Um, you can go into those all. But so we have a concept that seems good, but it means something else. And then you are taught to conform. And that's what's called word and idea laundering just like you have money laundering. We are putting it through a washing machine to have a different outcome. Words are used to confuse and separate. For those of you who have not read the works of Douglas Murray, I really advise you to. He's got this way, this very eloquent British way of putting things. It's never a problem. It's a prom problematization. And it's not a narrative. It's a meta-narrative. And so you will find that very simple language is complicated with the deliberate idea to confuse you. Why? Because you should never ever push back or have your own opinion. The problem here is that a university where we need to engage in open and honest discussions uh, that causes big, big problems. Our next concept is intellectual vandalism. You know that Gandhi cannot be quoted. He was a rapist. So you have to delete him from your history books. Nelson Mandela was also accused of uh, sexual misconduct. So there goes Nelson. That's the heart of intellectual vandalism. Everybody from Mandela to Churchill needs to be cancelled. And you cannot do anything with anything they ever did because they were not perfect, like you. They were only human. So the summary and definition here is science denying ideologies based on race, gender, 
have created more division and separation with little or no common middle ground in the last 10 years than the actual issues that they claim to solve has caused in the last 400 years. And we'll get to that. What's happening at Harvard University? What's happening at Princeton? Uh, Yale seemed to have taken a different route. The things are happening in the academic space and people are not aware of what's going on. A very important one if you really a lecturer and you're passionate about your students. The destruction of academic trust. There is a social contract in every classroom between you as a lecturer and your student. You as a lecturer is there to push, to expose, and put students in uncomfortable positions so they can learn things about the world and themselves and they will trust you to take them through that and show them why they had to go through it. But now we have an idea that the student thinks or comes with, I already know the answer, and you as professor is only there to confirm my knowledge, and if you do not comply, you do not deserve to be on the university campus. One of our problems here is that there's been a lot of academics used to schooling students rather than educating them. It's another beef if you really go and read the works of Thomas Sowell that he has with the academic environment. The difference between schooling and education. One of the reasons I decided to take on this topic tonight is I saw an interview program with 20 United States professors that has all been cancelled from their universities. Some were dragged from their campus by students wielding baseball bats and cans of petrol saying they were going to set them alight. Other was just informed by the university management that you fired. Um, and what was sad is that none, not one of those 20 professors, actually had a clue what happened. They had an absolute disconnect. They, couldn't, they cannot understand what happened and they all still believe that by playing the right cards and saying the right things, they will be welcomed with open arms back where they were, which is, of course, not going to happen. Is this our future? I hope not. The concept of the safe space. <clears throat> Should a university be a safe space? If a we get Julius Malema to come and speak on campus. Should there be a place where all the people who don't like him can go and draw color coloring books and uh, play with kittens and stuff so they can de, de offense themselves? I see some people are laughing. There's actual Ivy League universities that provide rooms with coloring books and crayons for students who can't cope with controversial speakers or controversial classes. And we'll get to that. It's not just don't invite a controversial figure to come and speak on the campus. Is the students will arrive. Um, might as well bring that up now. It's what happened at Cambridge University. The students draw up a list of books they found offensive. And that must be removed from the curriculum. Of course, Cambridge buckled and agreed. And two weeks later, the British Parliament gave a Cambridge an ultimatum, which means the entire senior management team had to quit. Of course, it's one of the legacies of Boris Johnson that we will most likely never hear about, especially on the BBC, is that the Conservative Party in Britain gave all the universities an ultimatum. Either you restore free speech and restore open dialogue, or you will literally be run from Westminster. Make your choice. <clears throat> Drew Simmons from Brown University, sort of her conclusion, and she also first went the extreme safe space and accommodative route, says the learning is an antithesis of comfort. The collision of views and ideologies is the DNA of the academic enterprise. Look, look at the word, it's the DNA. It's crucial for us as academics to be able to have open 
and honest discussions along scientific routes. We do not need any collision avoidance technology here, like safe spaces. Lastly, <coughs> another thing that's sort of going past a lot of people is, I call it the end of the double-blind peer review system. But if you've been publishing in a double-blind peer review environment, um, you're used to seeking, when will I get my next article out there? Which journal? Um, in South Africa, unfortunately, the government gives subsidies according to that. Um, I've in literally um, designed and created my own world word here, so please forgive me for it, ideologicalization. Journals have been ideologicalized and politicized. I've had personal experience in that. that I got papers back that says, uh, your work does not fit our message. And our message is not specified on the website. If you said on your website, listen, we are the, the following and this is our message, then great, I would never have submitted my paper. But the reviewer thought, where's your ideology? And the editor just went along, yeah, great. And yes, then, another great case of this is Professor Peter Ridd, James Cook, in Australia, after the BBC did their great environmental expose on the Great Barrier Reef to tell you how, e how bad it is and how um, Australia is killing the Great Barrier Reef. Peter Ridd has been working on the Great Barrier Reef his entire life, went and did a very, very thorough study, especially about bleaching of corals, where does all the chemicals go in the rivers that's supposed to be harming that, and he found that First of all, the chemicals go to New Zealand, not the Great Barrier Reef. So if anybody should be unhappy, it should be the, the Kiwis. But the Great Barrier Reef, like any other organism, is growing and changing. So in certain places it's dying, in certain places it's bleaching, and in other places it's growing. In fact, it's in a bigger and better condition than it's ever been. You would think that somebody would congratulate Peter Ritt for it. It wasn't 24 hours before he was fired. And uh, he since then were won numerous ca course cases, but also lost a lot. Uh, take that into account. Then, most recently at Princeton, a leading breast uh, cancer research professor had an affair with an assistant, not a student. It was a consensual affair, and they broke up amicably. And the friend, a friend of the assistant, went and. Um, actually made a, a criminal case of sexual abuse against the professor. Um, I don't want to get too much in deep, but the long and the short is, once again, he was fired. The institute that he created was closed. Um, and no journal, not one, is willing to publish a paper of this professor. Now, uh, it's harsh words, but... Uh, does it matter what your criminal, let's, let's make him a criminal, let's make him a serial rapist. If he's a leading physicist, does that matter when it comes to is, should the work be published or not? Is it our job as academics to make that call? So <clears throat> I think the future will definitely, um, and as you also see the way, we'll get to that <coughs> Universities are recasting themselves. Double by peer review will become an obsolete way of looking at research. will need to be much more practical and hands-on in the future. So there's some echoes of intellectualism, real rabbit holes you can go down. I really discovered a lot about Nietzsche in the last three weeks. Uh, the rise of global nihilism and the final, the finale mention. You had the Uber mention and the finale mention. Uh, final people, rubbing everything of meaning and value in order to create a society based on entertainment and amusement, lacking connection and attaching to anything else more than themselves. Sounds sort of like we are talking about Gen Z there. Another unlikely prophet. Carl Jung, 
failing to deal with the shadow and the integration of the ego leads to a person governed by the shadow and driven by the darkness of the shadow. Um, if we are to empower students, we'll need to take that into account. And lastly, Rene Descartes, famously known for experiential learning. One of the terms you will come across a lot in, but we should all be busy with experiential learning. Now the problem is if you do experiential learning without adding new knowledge, you're just busy with confirmation bias and all other confirmatory perception biases. So it's actually useless. You have to combine knowledge, new knowledge, and experience. Something to think about when you do your next class. So why dichotomy? Why did I decide on that word? I discovered this by incidence as sort of formulating in the 1880s, 1890s, two, word, two worlds started to exist surrounding academia, research, and the way we look at the world. The one was the, wor the world of John Stuart Mill, and the other one of Karl Marx. Uh, John Stuart Mill said that the university exists to understand the world through observation and careful analysis. And Karl Marx said a university exists to change the world. Now, so what? The problem is you can't do both. There's a thing called telos. And uh, telos means it's your reason for me for being. If you are here to observe the world and measure it and, and to figure out why the, why the world is what it is, you cannot be an activist because you know that you don't know. You simply haven't finished your discussion. While on the other hand, the activist will say, well, the science is settled. I already know what the outcome is. Therefore, we will now go and change the world based on our assumption. And that is the true dichotomy that universities really face because um, I think more and more there's a quest and a question for activism. But how many people are really geared for that? Coming to South Africa, <coughs> we should have no, no illusions about the fact that universities are here for social mobility and change. We're supposed to be activists. That's the policies that's been adopted since 94. Our problem is that the structure of South African universities are there for the Stuart, John Stuart Mill approach. So we still want to operate in the one way, and yet it is expected of us to operate in the other field. I am not going to go into all the dualities with you. But it, this whole storm is causing us to stand at the crossroads facing these dualities. Um, if you want to arm yourself and become intellectually aware, I really suggest you go and read up on it. And make sure that you understand what is meant by the words. Because the words and their meaning is what this debate is really about. The first is the, quick, the concept of a monologue versus a discussion. If you are not allowed to speak, and only my opinion counts, we have a monologue. There's no inclusion here, there's nothing, there's no discussion. And I'm, I, just, I use discussion, not dialogue, because usually there should be more than two. Dialogue means two. In the academic circles, we should discuss, research, find fault, and go deeper. There should never be a monologue in any serious discussion. Democratization versus demonstration of skill. Good enough that we opened up education in South Africa like they did in other parts of the world. I'm all for that. I would have 100% of people being taught and educated and empowered if I could. But can we demonstrate skill? Can our students demonstrate skill the day they walk off this campus? Well, the current viewers, especially on a pre-graduate level, know. Postgraduate, it changes significantly. Activism versus actualization. Generation Z 
is taught activism, but they're looking for self-actualization. Can you play a role? Dehumanization versus individualization. I specifically tried to sail around critical race theory and intersectionality. Um, but one of the things that do stand out, and it's definitely part of the discord, is you can either dehumanize somebody and make them part of an artificial group based on immutable traits, or you can individualize a person and look at what makes them different and what makes them special. Um, compelled speech versus liberty, I think I've said enough about that. Um, safe spaces, I think we've done enough about that. The difficult concepts, decolonization or cultural imperialism. Is there anybody here that think that South Africa's history was written up correctly? That we cover every, everything that happened, all the opinions that matter. So obviously there needs to be a revision of not only history, but a lot of things. So once again, we've got a nice word, decolonization. You should be for it. But if the whole idea is to do what Harvard is doing, that we're going to omit large tracts of history and knowledge for the sake of a message, then this is cultural imperialism. It is new American cultural imperialism. It is not decolonization. It's actually recolonization. Um, so be careful of that. Get involved in debates. People need inputs, and we, need, we do need a holistic view of South African history. I was always actually quite um, bemused by the whole concept of decolonization. As you know, I love history, and I like to read up. And then I've read up anecdotally something that no mainstream history book of South Africa mentions. Was the Boer War only between the British and the Boers? It's estimated that women and children and fighters included 52,000 Boers died in the Boer War. It is now estimated that 120 Botswana, 120,000 Botswana people died, mostly in concentration camps. Bet your standard three or grade five teacher did not teach you that. So we do have, we have a historic responsibility to make sure that the truth about South Africa and South Africa's history is known. But we cannot do it according to an external power that's interested in omitting facts. And if you want to know why I'm passionate about that and I'm willing to stand here, Anaida traveled with me to Tanzania, part of a master's degree, know that we were at Bagamoyo in Tanzania. It is the saddest place in all the world, bar two others I've been to. The Rwandan Genocide Memorial and the Killing Fields in Cambodia. 5,000 to 10,000 people per day were marched through Bagamoyo, Tanzania as part of the Arab slave trade to the slave markets of Zanzibar and beyond. Of those 5,000 people, less than 500 actually made it to Zanzibar because they were castrated at Bagamoyo. Most of them bled to death before they got to the market. So people who want to decolonization and admit that because it doesn't suit an agenda, I'm willing to fight you about that. That's a hill I'm willing to die on. Equality versus equity. Another Seemingly a harmless word. Who's not for equality? Does anybody want equality? Can we ever have equality? And the same goes about equity. Should we strive at least for equality and equity? I hope so. Hopefully we'll want a system that's just and fair. Um, the problem here is that it's used in terms of, should we actually harm somebody to give somebody other, other privilege or not? So the debate is about, most people want to make it about equal opportunities versus equal outcomes. I think equity is much more than that. That's a simplification of a much, much 
more complex system. Uh, I've thought, and the question should really be, how can we produce equitable systems that is just and fair and produce results, maybe not exactly the same for everybody, but at least fair. Everybody should be treated fair. We all got that innate human trait within us. We want fairness. So the problem is the us and them mentality. So this sums it up quite brilliantly as far as I'm concerned. The two opposing armies. So there'll be no peace until they renounce their rabbit god and accept our duck god of the same flag. Right, so what should we do in facing the dualities? Let's bring it home. As a result of what's going on in South Africa, there's predictions that only nine of the 26 universities in South Africa will exist in 10 years from now. Fortunately, NWU is on the list. It is expected that we will make it. Uh, the biggest concern that we have is the discontinuation of subsidies and that we will really have to rethink and be creative and innovative around that. Unfortunately, due to the nature of academic work, you'll find that a lot of people, especially danger for young academics, is the loss of meaning and becoming actively disengaged. It's just a job. I don't know if you've been there. I've been there. If you've been a, a lecturer for 14 years, you go through phases that you're it's just a job. Unfortunately, a new bunch of students comes along and you all fired up to change your lives again. Uh, loss of competence and skill and loss of quality. If people are going to be forced to think of new ways to make money, they might actually consider not doing it within the bounds of the university. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on financing uh, Good luck to the senior managers of that regard. I think you're already experiencing some of that. Um, I think a lot of it, we, we don't see the, the miracles that do happen behind closed doors when it comes to many of these things. So, if you want to be a leader, if you want to be somebody who makes a difference, unfortunately, you need to be sorted out first. So, Ming Tzu who says that uh, heaven will throw everything against you, possibly it can, to make you the person you're supposed to be to do the job that you should be doing. So don't expect the path to be easy if you want to be a leader and make a difference. <clears throat> Some final thoughts. About a month ago, there was a panel discussion at Peking University between uh, Lim Juana from Peking University, uh, Stephen Toop, New VC from Cambridge, Louise Richardson from Oxford, and Peter Salovey from Yale. And they have a whole discussion about the future. So I'm just going to read it. There's way too much information to just, but just to think about it. The future of research has to include practical research for pre-graduate students with senior professors in applicable fields that will count as job exposure. That's a mouthful. Have you thought about your research in those terms? Critical thinking and cultural intelligence. Anybody? You need to know about cultural intelligence. Remember me. Uh, need to be embedded in all curricula. It's not standalone concepts. It should literally be the foundation of all courses. Deliberate social integration across different population groups. You'll see, this is the professor from Yale speaking at Harvard. We've got racially segregated graduation ceremonies and racially segregated residences and dorm rooms going the opposite direction. <clears throat> Put people together so they have to work together so they can learn to know one another. Uh, deep diversity rather than superficial diversity. Um, interdisciplinary research will be only acceptable research. And we'll get a lot, there's a lot of this coming up if you think you can publish a paper on your own, not going to happen in the future. You will have to work with someone that's not from your own field. You want to write the economics paper, do it with somebody from health sciences or from 
physics. And with that, I don't mean they should quickly do fancy modeling for you. It should be interdisciplinary. That's what people, the future world environment is looking for. Uh, it should be about qualities and abilities, not about knowledge. You are no longer a conveyor of knowledge. You must forget the notion. Um, in the back of your mind, you should be thinking that, hopefully not for you, but your students will most likely go into a working environment, into jobs that do not exist today. Nearly half of new jobs created didn't exist 20 years ago. I think it's still around 50% 10 years ago. Um, so you are literally teaching people for stuff that you don't know what you're teaching them for. And whether you like it or not, and that is really, I think, for all of us in South Africa, a keystone, social mobility. If a student goes to a university, he should have a better quality of life than his parents. If not, then we as educators have failed him. I'm not saying that people make stupid mistakes. Uh, once again, quoting Douglas Murray, if you play silly games, you're going to have silly outcomes. But uh, if we do our jobs correctly, and that guy goes out in the market and apply himself, he will have a better future than his parents did. As an academic, you should realize that you are a node amongst networks. Not just one. You have a network inside Northwest University. It should be between faculties, interdisciplinary. You should have with other universities in South Africa and abroad. You should be linked to industry, and the list goes on. You're a node in an expansive network, and people will decide on your success based on the, your ability to basically write that network. The future work environment, and this is quite an interesting one, I thought about this a lot, is collaborative. Students should learn how to collaborate rather than to function individually. Individual assessments will become a thing of the past. I see some people shaking their heads. Maybe some, some students will not actually be able to pass third year economics. So yeah, stepping it up, going further, a guy from New York University, John Haight, does a lot of research on all these, the effect of all these things. And uh, really, it's, we should learn to be inclusive in our thinking, not exclusive. Um, when we're dealing with cancel culture and all these things, don't run away, seek to include. And one of his solutions that he found to be quite successful in studies up to now, along with critical thinking and cultural intelligence, is that cognitive behavioral therapy should also be part of your curricula. Cognitive behavioral therapy is just a way of thinking, a way to de-emotionalize yourself, to discuss your options, deal with dualities, and seek the best option for you and other people. <coughs> so it's a psych psychological approach also has some use in the coaching environment. Um, it's about self-management and that is the core of emotional intelligence, which is your greatest success marker for anybody in his career. Yeah. And any other things that were unfragile or anti-fragile students, so open-mindedness, intellectual courage, um, courage, tenacity, and so forth, how are you going to incorporate that? So that's sort of the message when it comes to dealing with this. Is I intend to destroy segregation by positive and embracing methods. When my brothers, meaning all other people, draw a circle to exclude me, I will draw a larger circle to include them. When they speak out for the privilege of a puny group, I shall shout out for the rights of all mankind. Paul and Murray, 1946. I think that's very powerful. So yes, things are changing rapidly. <coughs> Who will you be? Where will you be? What approach will you take? Hopefully tonight already you've decided on whether you're going to be an educator or an activist, at least. 
And that is the story in a nutshell. Hopefully I've given you a new perspective, at least, on what's currently going on around us. When it comes to acknowledgements, uh, the list really goes on. It's impossible to, think, to thank everybody. But really, Esme, Shante, Ilza, and Jana, who organized this event, would not have happened without them. Also, Prof. Babs, thank you very much. It's the dean of the faculty. And in that same breath, I will mention all the other previous deans while I was at the university, started with Prof. Tiens Elof, um, Elsie Lewitz, Susan Fisser, um, Sonia Swanepoel, I should not forget her. Without her, I would not be standing here tonight. She really worked very hard at Tarsi to get my CV in order for promotion to professor, so pity she can't be here tonight. All school directors past and present. There's two school directors sitting here, Valdo and Andre. Thank you very much for your role. Vainant can't be here tonight. He's got COVID, or he assumes he's got COVID. Um, Provoma over here that cannot be here tonight. She's the one that originally gave me the opportunity way back in 2008. Um, me and Volma had a, quite an interesting history of love and hate, and we had a discussion just before she left for Geneva uh, the other day and how far we've come, that after everything, both of us could draw a bigger circle to include the other one. Uh, so there's a story there not to exclude people based on how we feel today. Uh, all the colleagues from the School of Economics, thank you for being here, thank you for your camaraderie and always putting up with me when I do silly things. Also mentioned the members of the UMC and the SMC that are here. Uh, for you guys, I really say thank you for the opportunities that you gave me in management exposure, leadership development exposure. Um, that really changed my life and my career. And lastly, there's a couple of people here that doesn't meet those criteria. They are alumni students, who I just call them friends. I will mention Jacob specifically, Anne and Gabriel. For those of you who don't realize Gabriel is here tonight, thank you very much for being here. Um, that to me is very important to mention them by name because it says that you can become friends with your students. They don't need to become faces and photographs on Facebook. Um, very special thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing my journey. I appreciate you being here. Namaste. Thanks. I'm not, never quite sure whether I'm tall enough to appear over the screen or not. Um, colleagues, a, a very heartfelt note of thanks on behalf of our university's management, the leadership gathered here this evening, Prof. Babs, colleagues from the faculty. It's a big occasion when a, a colleague comes of age, so to speak, in the professoriate and a, a really wonderful time to celebrate an achievement that is a consequence of all your hard work. And when I look at all of you, I'm mentioning all your hard work, but of course we have Henry, Prof. Henry's hard work that also resulted in this recognition of becoming a full professor and then going through the experience of the inaugural address. Um, I, I have to say, Prof. Henry, that as I listened to you, there were kind of moments when I couldn't decide whether I was in agreement or not. And, uh, and um, uh, it's so interesting to me that in your work with us as an institution, we have um, always a provocative thought process which I think challenges you at every turn as to whether you're in agreement with some of the things that have been put forward or not. And I guess that lies at the heart of the academic enterprise, that there should always be this engagement between knowledge and ignorance. 
and that the engagement is a, a form of interrogation. It takes the form of a discussion, as you put it. It can sometimes be a dialogue. <clears throat> I found it really interesting that you linked democratization and commercialization of education to the generational drivers that we see coming forward in Gen Z at this stage. And it really does make us think about the increasing importance of our employers and the increasing impact of our student voices on change in the curriculum. So that I also took as a particular insight uh, from your talk with us this evening, um, considering that knowledge nowadays as prized by the employer is not knowledge of the subject content area alone, but increasingly the skills needed to navigate multiple areas of knowledge, not necessarily within a graduate's own specialization. This is so very much the 21st century and not the 20th century that many of us in this room grew up in. Um, unsettling was also a word that came to mind when I listened, because your talk invited us to be skeptical about some of academia's most cherished ideals. It leads us to consider the link between personal integrity and knowledge, um, between the power of professors and the assumed subservience of students, a relationship that might have been fairly untroubled in our past in South Africa, even with our history of vibrant student activism, has the professoriate really been troubled enough? And is that lack of troubling between the generations that many of our colleagues talk about and which you have touched on, so thank you very much for raising it, is that lack of troubling a symptom of intergenerational dysfunction or a symptom of relational rebellion that invites us to recommit to our professions as an academic, as academics, to our commitment to our students, not simply a commitment to a form of employment or what you call just a job. So, Prof. Henry, thank you so much for um, a scintillating, fascinating discussion. I'm sure everybody would like to. Uh, have an opportunity to take you on on some of these points after a drink or two later, <laughs> later on. Um, but on behalf of our institution, Dr. Tia Becker, our Vice Chancellor, and our university's leadership and our faculty gathered, I would like you to be presented with a certificate of um, appreciation. And after that, ladies and gentlemen, we shall, we shall have an opportunity to sing the national anthem, and then the academic procession will leave. We will ask you, Henry, to lead us out so that everybody can have an opportunity to congratulate you on your way out. And I think we process towards the main entrance at the back of the venue. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's present the certificate and congratulate our colleague and the faculty. Well done, Henry.